Hello, my name is Samantha Lovelace and I'm thrilled you could join me today. This is the original presentation I shared the day of my thesis defense, January 20th, 2020. I'm very happy to say that I passed. After revisions and taking some time to just relax after a crazy few months, COVID happened. That, along with childcare and work and working on a different paper and expecting my second child, I never got around to sharing my work. So I figured what better time than now, the anniversary of the original presentation. Without further ado, please enjoy my thesis defense presentation, Factors of Change Readiness for Public Service Design Implementation. I've always tried to do work that makes people's lives just a little bit better. When I started my career in design in a private sector agency, I was involved in every step of a design project with an experienced team of practitioners who knew how to get good work out the door. I knew the work was good and that it was delivering on what it needed because I was reporting on the results. But when I began to work as a designer working on design projects for the government of Canada, things changed. I was no longer involved in every step of the process. I was no longer working directly with the people delivering the end product. And as far as I knew, the work was rarely getting out into the hands of real people, at least the way that it was intended. If it was, I certainly wasn't hearing how well it was working or if it had accomplished the objectives it aimed to achieve. It seemed like my work had stopped making things better and no client feedback could shed light on why. What was I missing? One day, I was speaking with a change management specialist about my conundrum when she introduced me to the concept of change readiness or the ideal state an organization should be in before they can successfully transition from their current state to an ideal future state. Specifically, she told me about Beckard and Harris's change formula, which proposed that for a change to be successful, there had to be a level of dissatisfaction with the status quo, a clear desired state, and practical first steps towards achieving the desired state. And that these three factors had to be strong enough that they outweighed the cost of changing. This theory was interesting to me because I'd never considered if the organization could make the changes needed to bring a design I had proposed to life. Could this be the key to getting design in the Canadian Federal Public Service turned into something real people could use? Authors propose that design is the outcome of a mindset and a process that results in a plan or a sketch. It gives an idea shape and it tells others how a problem may be solved or how an opportunity might be capitalized on. It can be seen as an outline of what needs to change in order to make something better or a map for how to get from today to a desirable future state. One in which an organization and the people it serves receive benefit from something new and receive value from the change. It has also been proposed by a number of authors that design can generate a measurable amount of value for public service organizations by helping them achieve policy goals, reduce costs to the taxpayer, and increase innovation and global competitiveness. But design can only generate value for these organizations if it is something that can be made real. But value isn't delivered by making any design real. Authors suggest that a design must meet a certain set of criteria to generate value. First, there must be a design, a plan or conceptualization of an idea that is the result of a problem solving process. That design must have been created based on some type of baseline or some starting point. The design must be good. And to be good, it must set out to achieve one or many objectives. It must be based on existing design principles, must follow design rules and guidelines. It must be unique and not simply copy an existing design, and it must be something that can be measured. It must also have balanced consideration for the needs of the individuals who will be most affected by the design, the needs of the organization responsible for the outcomes of the design, and the appropriateness of the form and function of the design. The design must also be desirable, viable, and feasible. And finally, the design must be something that can be made real. In order to generate value from designs in the Canadian Federal Public Service, each of these factors are likely important considerations when striving to reach an ideal future state. And if we think about the impact this transformation may have on the organization, it will probably result in something, if not many things, changing before that idea is transformed into something real. 
but is the organization ready to change in support of generating value? For example, when a new step is recommended in the website management process to regularly monitor traffic to a specific section of the site, will the team be able to introduce this into their regular workflow? What about when a new service is designed to help vulnerable populations receive their old age security payments? Will the organization be able to tell the vulnerable population that this new service exists? And if so, will 1-800-O-Canada be ready with the answers if people have questions and call in? What must happen in order to make sure these designs can be implemented and the organization and the people it serves receive the value that the designs aim to deliver? In the change management discipline, there is a theory that for an organization to successfully move from a current state to a future desired state or to change, organizational change readiness must first be achieved. Many authors have proposed frameworks to explore the factors of organizational change readiness and identify if an organization is ready for a change. In the selection of 12 change readiness frameworks that I explored, many of the frameworks included similar factors. In the six examples I have here on the slide, we can see similarities across the frameworks, such as a clear desired state seen in Beckard and Harris's change formula and Heath and Heath's elephant and the rider model, or the factors of remedy found in Connor's pain and remedy framework and knowledge of how to change in the ProSci ADCAR model. But none of the frameworks contain the same factors and it wasn't clear which factors were more important in which case. And although many of the frameworks I explored were assessed for use in the healthcare setting, there was not one framework that was specifically designed or recommended for the public service. Although I believe that change readiness was likely an important part of the design implementation process in the Canadian Federal Public Service, and even though I like the approach of the frameworks to help people make sense of the world around them, I couldn't definitively say which framework would be a good tool for myself and my colleagues and design to use to learn more about an organization's readiness to move forward with the design. So, how might I identify one framework to support design implementation in the Canadian Federal Public Service? I use three qualitative methods to build a better understanding of the factors that may contribute to successful public service design implementation and see if they fit within any of the frameworks in the selection of 12 that I had chosen for my study. To do this, I did a content analysis of the factors from literature using in vivo, I explored real life factors through participant inquiry, and I compared the factors found in the participant data to the factors in the frameworks to see if any one fit. I began with the frameworks in literature using in vivo, a computer assisted qualitative data analysis software. I undertook three rounds of content analysis to develop a detailed and thorough understanding of the factors the frameworks had in common. I undertook this rigorous assessment as the frameworks use different terms to describe similar things. I wanted to be sure I was able to explore similar factors both across the frameworks um, and in the data from real world experiences. To do this, I explored how the authors talked about factors of change readiness. I then took all the factors in the author's language and looked for patterns and then categorized them. This resulted in a set of six themes that reflected factors that the authors proposed were important considerations in determining organizational change readiness and whether an organization would be able to successfully implement a change. The themes were capability to change, commitment to change, a need for change, situational readiness, a low cost of change, and a clear and desired end state. The theme of capability to change was the only theme that was found in all 12 of the frameworks I explored in my content analysis. This is shown by the complete bar indicating the magnitude below the box that contains the theme in the slide. The theme that was also found to have a high magnitude was the commitment to change theme, which was uncovered in 11 of the 12 themes. This indicated that it was likely uh, that both the capability to change and commitment to change themes were important considerations in determining the organizational organization's readiness for change. However, more than just the two factors were indicated as being important considerations in change readiness in the literature. And so all six themes and subcategories indicated by the circles and gray rectangles on the chart 
were included in a set of provisional codes or codes to start a content analysis that were used to begin exploring participant data. Now that I had a better understanding of the factors that the literature proposed may indicate readiness for change, I needed to know if these factors were the same as the factors that may have contributed to real life experiences with successful and unsuccessful design projects in the Canadian Federal Public Service. To do this, I collected stories from people working on design projects in the Canadian Federal Public Service and pulled factors out of their stories that may have contributed to the success of their projects. To get participants thinking about their experiences and ready to share their stories, participants were each given a research kit which contained cultural probes to help them think deeply about their experiences. Each kit asked the participant to share a story about a successful project and an unsuccessful project using a workbook and a mind map tool. When the participants had completed the kits, I met with them in person so that they could share their stories with me firsthand. As they told their stories, I wrote up notes that reflected their voice and prompted them with questions to build a thorough understanding of their experience. I interviewed 18 participants, collected 34 stories of successful and unsuccessful design projects, and created 322 digital files from the participant research kits and my notes that I would use in a content analysis to explore real life factors that may contribute to design project success in the Canadian Federal Public Service. Here's an example of a participant's mind map. In the center, the participant has listed some of the outcomes of their project. The participant was then asked to consider what it might, might have contributed to the project outcome. This was placed in the squares. Then in the circles, the participant was prompted to include what they thought may have contributed to the square, and then again, they were asked to identify what may have contributed to what they put in the circle. Again, using in vivo, I explored the participant data in three cycles of detailed coding and analysis. To begin, I used the provisional codes generated after I analyzed the frameworks and literature to begin exploring the participant data and find similarities between the participant data and the frameworks. As I uncovered the factors that may have contributed to project success, I also, simultane I also <laughs> simultaneously coded them with in vivo codes which represented the participant's voice. 1,457 in vivo codes were generated in the first cycle of coding. I then undertook a second cycle to find patterns in the data and categorize the in vivo codes that I generated. As I explored the data and new structure of the factors that may have contributed to project success in the Canadian Federal Public Service emerged, Although some of the categories uncovered in the participant data were the same or like those uncovered in the literature, the magnitude or number of in vivo codes in these categories had changed. It was found that many of the in vivo codes generated in the participant data could be organized into two new themes of expertise to do the work and leadership and teamwork. However, these two themes alone were too general to make meaningful conclusions about what factors may contribute to successful Canadian Federal Public Service design implementation, and so a third cycle of analysis was undertaken. After the third and final cycle of categorization of the factors from participant data, it was found that there were likely six key factors that supported successful design implementation in the Canadian Federal Public Service. People involved, uh, and they were, people involved in the project could make the change happen. People involved in the project wanted to do the work. People knew why the work was being done. The project fit within the existing context. People knew how the work was being done. And there was a shared understanding about the work. Now that I knew which factors were likely to contribute to successful design implementation in the Canadian Federal Public Service, the last step was to compare these factors to the frameworks from literature and find the best fit. After doing a comparative review of all 12 frameworks against the six key factors I identified in the analysis of the participant data, it was found that none of the frameworks accounted for all six of the key factors. However, I did find that the ProSci Agfa model was the best fit of the 12 frameworks. They accounted, it accounted for four of the six factors. Um, 
and included the factors which accounted for the greatest magnitude of perceived importance in the key factors, which were people could make the change happen, they wanted to do the work, they knew why the work was being done and how the work was being done. Despite being the best fit, the PROSI ADCAR model was not a perfect fit. The factor of reinforcement from the model was not found in the participant data, and the factor of ability to demonstrate skills and behaviors was found to be too specific to account for all the things that enabled people to do the work. As such, I proposed a modified version of the PROSI ADCAR model as a tool to support design implementation in the Canadian Federal Public Service. And I called it the Public Service Design Implementation Framework, or PSDIF for short. This framework exclude, excludes the factor of reinforcement to make the change stick and broadens the ability to demonstrate skills and behaviors factors from the ADCAR model and adds in the factor of understanding the context of change to determine the project fit at the beginning of the formula. The PSDIF also adds a modifier or sh of shared understanding to the overall formula, indicating that there is no, if there is no shared understanding about the work, even if all other factors are in place, the change will not be successful. For my thesis, I analyzed 12 change readiness frameworks from the literature and found common themes that may contribute to the organizational readiness for change. I collected and analyzed 34 stories from 18 people working on Canadian federal public service design projects to identify factors that may contribute to design project success. I compared the factors that may contribute to project success found in the participants' real life experiences to the factors that may contribute to change found in the literature to identify common themes and outliers. I did not find one framework from the literature that accounted for all the factors un uncovered from the participant experiences. I identified that the PROSI ADCAR model was likely the closest fit the to the participants' experiences. I proposed my own change readiness assessment framework, the PSDIF, which was based on the PROSI ADCAR model to determine if Canadian federal public service organizations were ready to move projects forward and transition to a future state when the organization could generate value from a design. In the future, I hope to use the framework in real life to assess it and understand if it can if it can support successful design implementation in the Canadian Federal Public Service, and if so, how? Well, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to hear about my research. Uh, before I go, I just wanted to extend a huge thank you to my thesis advisor, Chantal Trudel from Carleton School of Industrial Design and my co-advisor, Dr. Paul Thibodeau of Carleton's Department of Sociology and Anthropology and a colleague at the Government of Canada. I could not have done any of this without them. If you'd like to find out more about my research, don't hesitate to get in touch on LinkedIn or Twitter or in the comments below. Thanks again and all the best.